Yeah, or you can also just use your own Hi, folks. If you're just joining us, this is a Scaling Up webinar featuring one TAM. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Um, everyone's phone should be on mute. And Sharon, I'll, um, I'm just going to mute your phone until it's just before the, the presentation time. Once again, folks, if you're just joining us, this is a Scaling Up webinar featuring one TAM. We'll get started in about six minutes or so, so just sit tight.
Once again, if you've just joined us, welcome to the Scaling Up webinar. We'll get started in just about two minutes or so. Um, everyone's phone will be on mute for the, the webinar, um, but we will open up the lines at the end. Feel free to check out that chat box. I just plugged in a link to our Scaling Up Toolkit, um, so you can peruse that while you're waiting for the webinar to start. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome again. My name is Cass Hardy. I work for the Natural Resource Stewardship and Science Directorate in our Biological Resource Division. I'm the team lead for our Scaling Up initiative, and we are proud to be hosting our monthly webinar series as we kick off 2018. Um, I should say here that although this is um, the first webinar of the year, we do have a range of webinars that we've been hosting over the last few years. We have just about 35 recordings now. Um, all webinars are intended to expose resources or um, <clears throat> tools that enable parks or programs to work beyond boundaries. So feel free to check out that link that I posted in the chat box to the Scaling Up Toolkit. I uh, go find all the recordings there. In addition, in a minute, I'll post a link to an external site with a network for landscape conservation. So if you're a partner joining us today, you can access all of our, our webinars on our external um, site as well. So with that said, I would like to introduce um, Sharon Farrell with the One Tam Initiative. Uh, she'll be our presenter today. We'll have about a 20, 25 minute presentation and then we'll open up the lines for questions. Um, feel free to use the question chat box if you do have questions to that Q&A. Okay, thanks again for it. Hi Cass, uh, for this webinar. I'm not used to not looking you in the eyes. Um, I work with the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy. We are the nonprofit support partner for the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. So I'm located here in the San Francisco Bay Area and I'm going to share with you what I'm calling Tales from a Mountain. Uh, we have a mountain in our region called Mount Tamalpais, it's in Marin County, and we have been uh, working as a part of a collaborative for almost five years now, and what I'm going to share are basically the lessons that we've learned through our working together. So the green uh, polygon on this map represents the area that the Tamalpais Land Collaborative um, focuses on, and today's presentation is going to introduce the collaborative. Uh, public facing initiative, but also talk about some research that we've been undertaking for the last four years, which has been really helpful in us beginning to understand the, um, the complexity and the lessons and the relationships of partnership building. And then from that research, we've been able to really distill down some key lessons learned. And then I have some questions for all of you to consider as we move forward in this. So what is the collaborative, the Temple Pius Lions Collaborative? It's a partnership of the federal agency, the National Park Service, uh, the California State Parks, uh, working in partnership with Marin County Parks and a municipality, the Marin Municipal Water District. Together, those lands, these are all the land managers, compile about 52,000 acres here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And then I work for the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, a nonprofit. And our role is really what we call the backbone. We provide capacity and administrative support to the collaborative. And we also provide the communications and the fundraising for the collaborative to be able to achieve its collective goals, its collective vision. It was really formed around 
being able to look at what opportunity does working at a mountain-wide scale present to us as a partnership? What can we do together that we couldn't do individually in the areas of resource stewardship, areas of um, education and interpretation, areas of trail stewardship, and volunteerism and philanthropy? Throughout your hymn, you also reference WANTAM. WANTAM is our public-facing initiative of this partnership. It is the way in which we engage the community, the way in which we engage our funders, and the ways in which we deliver our programs and projects. So lessons learned, I referenced that we were a part of a social science um, study. When we first began our project, our initiative, um, we were approached by a funder who said, we would be really interested in having you serve as a guinea pig, if you will, to be studied. And I'm sure you're probably all thinking, well, what did that mean? And we felt the same. We um, basically uh, looked into how, well, the, the researchers were interested in three things. They wanted to understand how to measure value, benefit, and impact of landscape stewardship partnerships. They identified that there was very little research in this area. There's a lot more research in the healthcare field and other fields. And so with that, they asked if we would be open to being studied for a five-year period, and we agreed. And in addition to looking at a quantifiable way to measure those areas, they also asked if we could be studied by a social science researcher who would be looking at telling our story, if you will, looking at developing a series of case studies. And what this has entailed, basically, is having someone who comes to our meetings, the researcher, surveys not only of our staff, but also the community we serve and the scientists we work with. And we're entering into our last year of that, and we hope to publish it in October. But what I'm distilling down in today's webinar is just some of the things that they have continued to stay are really important as we look at partnership formation. These don't reflect the quantifiable metrics I, me I mentioned about impact, value, and benefit. Those will be published in October. So lesson number one. Um, and for many of you, I don't know where you sit as far as partnership development. Some of you, I imagine, are probably working partnerships that are very evolved. Others might be just contemplating partnerships. Um, this, for us, as I said, we've been um, undertaking our work for about four years, but really around formation. And I think that we invested about almost nine months to a year's time, really, in this area, about being very deliberate about articulating what our shared vision was, being able to think and describe what our collective priorities and goals were, and to really look at what foundational documents do we need. In some cases, one agency would need one type of document, others would need a different. We have a, a memorandum of understanding that is signed by all parties that is reflective of our large tenure. These are our goals, these are our roles, this is how we make decisions. We also have cooperative agreements between my organization and the agencies that we support. And then from that, we have financial transactions and other agreements that we've developed to streamline the work that we're undertaking. I think critical. So all of this is being able to assess and adapt as we move forward. The next is really being intentional about um, our governance structure. So this reflects our governance structure. And in, in a snapshot, basically, we have an executive team. So our collaborative, our partnership, the vision, the work planning that comes out of it, the collective impact we hope to achieve is really um, overseen by our executives. So we have a representative from each partner who is on that team, and then we have a working group. These reflect two staff from each partner, but more on the mid-management level, who in essence make sure that the work plan is developed on an annual basis, it's achieved, we are attentive to agency needs, we are developing community outreach and engagement strategies that I'll talk about, and then based upon our work, we have a series of um, committees that are uh, staffed through our interagency teams. And the, the intention of developing this is not so much just to add another set of meetings, is each one looks to advance something that we have collectively defined as a goal. So for example, uh, in our youth initiatives, we identify we do not serve high school students very well as a collective, so we identified that need, we developed a program that we collaboratively manage, and then we advance it. So that committee works on making sure it's meeting the intentionality of the goals. 
This is a graphic that we developed in the very first um, two meetings, and I show this in the next slide to be reflective of just finding ways just to capture you know, what we're doing. This is capturing our four key areas of work, our goals, if you will, and it really speaks to the fact that we uh, really value public awareness and engagement as a foundation to achieving our work. It talks about the goals and projects and programs that will have, enable us to achieve our collective impact, and basically the road we foresaw to establish our partnership. And so this really just speaks to a graphic that we use to further um, define the intentionality around the vision. This next slide has two quotes, and these quotes are from Frank Dean, who was our superintendent here at the National Park Service at that time. I think the bottom quote really spoke to um, working in a collaborative because, in essence, we're working in ways we don't always typically work with it, and it's sometimes very difficult. We have barriers that we have to you know, move through. We have our own systems. We have our own culture. And he would continually say, it's not you know, basically how do we get there, it's really it's basically focusing on I can do this. You know, it's, it's the focus on the pathway forward versus the question as to if you can actually accomplish this. And he was also very um, articulate about let's not lose our agency identity when it comes to the things we do on the lands we manage, but if we're going to aspire to a collective vision and if we're going to aspire to communicating what that looks like in a community setting and achieve our goals, it's really important that we continue to advance the identity of the collaborative. And what I mean by that, when I talked about the community-facing piece, we, in essence, branded our collaborative. So we, as I described, call it one TAM. And so a lot of the way in which the community sees this work that is being done strictly in partnership through that framework is done through this particular initiative, one TAM. This is the way we engage a broader volunteer community. This is the way we're able to fundraise to support the aspirations of the collaborative and the work planning of the collaborative. This is the way that we're hoping that people can see themselves as a part of the vision. So this is um, a tool that we've used and it's been interesting for me because um, a lot of my colleagues have said in reflection that branding their collaborative might have had some value in helping to elevate its role, elevate it as a priority within their own organizational structure. Another key lesson learned was articulating our values and principles early on. Uh, we spent a lot of time speaking, talking about what are the principles that are really going to guide our partnership and that we'll hold each other accountable to. And many of these, for those of you um, who knew Brian O'Neill, um, really came out of his 21 principles of partnership. And then we developed a few others that really spoke to, um, you know, specifically our geography and the culture in which we work within. And so it, it was a, a very important activity. We continue to come back to these, especially when we have new staff, when we're looking at succession planning or we're bringing in new partners, because this is the culture of our partnership. This frames how we work together and the intentionality around the values that we want all of our staff to aspire to. I think a critical one, and this one we speak a lot to, and I'm sure in many of your own um, parks, this may be true too, is capacity. You know, it's one thing to have aspirational vision. It's another to have a job beyond a job because you already have a job of managing one geography and then in a partnership structure, sometimes that adds to um, our work. You know, there is an intentionality around having to be able to work with partners as well as uh, your own staff. So we spend a lot of time reflecting on capacity through um, our work. We continually, probably once a quarter, make sure that you know, we check in to see if we have the capacity to achieve the work plans that we set out for each other or set out as a collective, and then we adapt them consistently. We, um, as our collaborative evolved, identified the need to actually hire staff to support the work. So our role as the Parks Conservancy is to fundraise to support the hiring of staff, and these staff, while they work for the nonprofit, they actually, administratively, they actually work for all of the partners to achieve the collective goals. And what I mean by that is each of the partners is involved in the work planning. So if we're doing early detection on a national park land and a state park land, those two resource specialists are working with the appropriate staff member to make sure that all the protocols are consistently aligned and that you know all the necessary things to actually work on the land are undertaken. So we have a pretty amazing team of five individuals who actually works specifically in support of the collaborative. 
another lesson learned was it's different, you know, everyone has different vocabulary. How we talk about one thing may be different in a state park than a national park. But really, how we talk within the community setting was the area that we focused in developing our common vocabulary. And it linked a lot to public participation. Here in Marin County, we have a very invested public and very invested in the mountains that we're collaboratively uh, managing. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we engage in a thoughtful way and begin to shift the way we talk, um, you know, which is often based in you know, more of a transactional and formal setting to one that's more adaptable and has relationship, building relationships for the long term, just as we were building the relationships within the collaboration ourselves. And this is just an example of something some of our staff developed to remind ourselves we actually have magnets of this. We put them in the office because we do so much work with the community, whether we're leading volunteer programs or we're working um, at a farmer's market or something to, you know, that, that um, something similar to that. And it's also very helpful when new staff come on. In addition to this, we also have communication uh, of language that we're developing amongst ourselves just as we talk about our work in general. How do we talk about stewardship? What are the principles of stewardship? So this is an evolving conversation, but one that we all agreed was a priority. The next one was sometimes when you start an effort like this, there's an investment you have to take and there are risks you have to take to be able to advance it to a point where it becomes sustainable and it's basically more balanced in its work. And one of the early investments that we had to make was we were questioned um, by a large number of the public and even by many of the stakeholders would say, they'd look at the picture of that mountain and they'd say, it's beautiful. Uh, what's wrong? Why now? Why, why, why scale your work to a partnership level to look at advancing some of these very ambitious collective goals, which reflected on healthy ecosystems and you know building the next hundred years of stewardship? So we had to take a step back, and we had to really um, we did something that now in reflection I look was quite ambitious. We brought together all of the agency's data for 40 years worth of data, um, whether it be the county and the Park Service, and then all of the research data that we had, and we said, okay, how do we use this to distill it down into something that we can identify indices for health, recognizing that the Park Service has an INM program and had a vital science program, but also recognizing that that language wasn't always consistent with what the state parks were doing and the regional parks. So we identified 25 different indicators, and then we, through um, an assessment process, looked at the health, looked at the trends, the conditions, and then developed a simple dashboard, which is one page in length, that is our community a communication tool um, that is based upon this report to the top left, which is a 360-page report. We knew the community was not probably going to read 360 pages, let alone all of our staff, so we developed a simple dashboard that then now we can tell our story in a more thoughtful way. And we didn't want to have a feeling of despair come from this. We wanted to be able to have areas where, it, no matter if you were interested in trail stewardship or resource management as a volunteer, you could contribute as a community scientist to advance and improve the condition and trends of the indicators that we had utilized to tell the story of the larger health. Another big lesson is really being attentive to cultural differences. Two of our partners have elected officials on the board. Uh, we have one who um, works, you know, they're, they're uh, higher level management is our Sacramento, and we also have a federal partner um, who has basically, you know, working on a Washington scale. So we spend a lot of time talking about each culture. Where are the areas of concern? Where are our red flags? How do we build common understanding? How do we work with staff across all of these various different agencies to basically both understand, appreciate, recognize, and see strengths in? So this is an area that we continue to spend time on um, because there's always changing partners and changing community interests. Perhaps I think one of the biggest lessons that we learned is it's so important to take on some early successes. I don't know, uh, for all of you working in partnership, one of the things that can be really daunting is to think, okay, I'm going to another meeting. I really am hoping this is gonna provide value. It's gonna advance something that's a priority for me, you know, and wanting to see some evidence of that value. So early on, we decided we would do a number of mountain-wide volunteer efforts where we brought all the partners together and we scaled up our volunteer programs collaboratively to undertake work on 
whoever's land needed it for whatever goal that we were looking to achieve. And we've consistently done that. We consistently have what we call small wins that really continue to punctuate the need for and the value of the partnership. I ask my colleagues on a regular basis, you know, are we still serving value? And is that value advancing your own strategic plans and your own goals? And in our minds, when that value, if we are adding value, then we need to reconsider the partnership structure, is the partnership being successful? And that links to work, getting work done. Um, when we first began our work, uh, outside, you know, to that bigger story, that bigger vision of having a collective um, to advance on a collective scale, we determined that we had four core areas of work that we as a collaborative would undertake. The first is really around community and conservation. It's that linking of people and science and stewardship. And so uh, we created a number of programs that we had identified as gaps that we weren't able to do as well individually. Um, a lot were linked to community science, and a lot of them were linked to youth involvement and integrating and building more diverse audiences that are supporting many of our volunteer programs. Um, so we have about six different programs that we support through that. And then we looked at our mountain is a water source for Marin County, for about 75% of Marin County. So water is a significant value from an ecosystem services, but also from a natural resource perspective. So we uh, have a number of projects that we've identified over the next five years that we want to scale up and fundraise for that really build upon um, and support wetlands restoration. Trail corridors, um, it's probably easy to imagine that many of our trails span multiple jurisdictions. So this is another area of focus for us to be able to look at if we're going to start treating a trail on a state park's land and, and that trail runs directly into a national park land, you know, how can we advance that project together? Are there some procedures that we want to standardize or methodologies? And what's the sequencing and how do we message it with the public regarding closures? So these are just some of the things we consider as we're advancing our projects. And then legacy projects. What are the ones that are going to leave an impact for a long time? We have a lot of challenges with forest disease and pathogens and drought. So that's, that's not just an agency issue, that's a mountain-wide issue, that's a regional issue, it's actually a statewide issue and beyond. So what projects can we undertake that improve our own scientific understanding of you know, what those issues are? And then how do we manage for disease movement across all landscapes, recognizing we have trails and roads that move through them? I think perhaps my greatest challenge uh, helping facilitate this collaborative is developing shared systems. Um, I'm an ecologist by training. Um, I am definitely a person who loves data. And one of the biggest challenges we have, and I imagine you might have it in your own work, is we all have different servers. We have different firewalls. We have oftentimes different privacy rules and issues. So how do we create cloud-based systems that are consistent with our policies and regulations, but allow for us to look at data at a regional scale, as well as at an individual agency scale. So what we've been doing is we've been developing partnerships here in California for weed management, for example. We have um, a nonprofit called CalFlora. We've been able to form a partnership with them to actually reprogram a significant part of their database to be able to actually um, collect data, such that you're actually able to look at a collaborative le level, how that data reports up, as well as at an individual agency level, and then that all the reports are consistent with the databases of each agency. For example, the state parks use Maximo. For our national park colleagues, they need to report up using GIPRA goals. So how do we take the culture of those agencies and those requirements and build systems that increase efficiency and hopefully will become part of the organizational culture and not something that is only, you know, something that adds work, if you will. And with that, this continued assessment and evaluation that we do um, with our work, because for us, we feel like if we're going to be good stewards and if we're going to be able to connect to not only ourselves but other agencies and restore the landscape, we have to have shared systems to be able to um, both collect and report out um, all of the data that we are uh, utilizing for some land management. Grassroots engagement was another big um, lesson for us. Again, I've mentioned that we have a very active and engaged community. And so our early effort was to map out who has an invested interest in our geographic resource, not only through looking individually as to each partner who's already got what relationship. And we mapped out, as I said, about 64 different stakeholder groups. 
And so we went as a collaborative representative, whether it was a National Park Service staff person with a State Park staff person, and had what I call cups of tea. And we would go to either their board meetings, meet them in a cafe, and just talk about their own interests, their own investment, how could we have added value in working together? For example, one friends of group leads interpretive hikes on this mountain. So how can we publicize their programs or maybe even add some uh, additional information to their programs? And then we don't have to necessarily undertake that all ourselves. So it was really about connect building ties, building trust, developing connections, and long-term support. This is not to just uh, confuse you. <laughs> what this is is actually a social network map the research that um, is undergoing, right, is being undertaken, is basically, um, in addition to looking at the partnership itself, it's looking at all the social connections and how they work. And this is four years in. Each of these blue dots represents a stakeholder group. And when we first started this work, there were very few connections. Each line reflects a connection. And this research is measuring the trust between the stakeholder groups, each of the agencies and the collaborative, the uh, level of um, communication, the, uh, the commitment to building further that relationship, but it gives us a, a sense of who we're working with. And I think in reflection, one of the good things, it's really hard to maintain 60 cups of tea, plus build that out every single year. We started to identify which of the groups are the ones that have the greater number of connections within the community that we could then begin our relationships strengthen our relationships with them and through them connect with many other individuals or other organizations that we might not have the necessary as much time to connect with. So my closing slide really is um, around planning for sustainability. I think when we began this partnership uh, in the first executive team meeting, two of our executives said, we need to plan this partnership with sustainability in mind. And I think that that meant a number of things to them. It meant we need to have succession planning as a part of this. So recognizing that people will come and go, at certain times, maybe even partners may shift and change. And that we needed to have a high level of integration, meaning that you know when you look at how we work, um, you may have some folks who you cooperate with, others who you collaborate with. Our intention is that we integrate, that we integrate around the areas where we have collective interest and collective vision and we're undertaking collective work that we become fully integrated as partners. Impact. If we can't, at the end of the day, say that we've had an impact by being in this partnership, by delivering work that we couldn't have done individually, then we, again, need to reevaluate. But for us, we're looking at a number of ways to measure impact. We measure impact by the work on the ground. We measure impact by the strength of the partnership. We measure impact by the relationships we're forming in the community and their responses to how they're developing relationships with us. So there's a number of ways of volunteer retention. And then inspiration. Um, I facilitate a lot of the meetings which we work with our partners. And um, as I reflect, if we don't have fun, if we aren't inspired by working at a collective scale, by, seeing, by being a part of something bigger, then that's something, again, that we need to reevaluate. I think you need a heavy dose of all three of these to be able to sustain a partnership. And one of the things that came out of our um, early research, our social science research, that really surprised me was the fact that um, 70 to 80% of the staff reported that they had increased job satisfaction by being a part of this partnership, or being a part of a partnership and seeing something bigger. And that was really, um, you know, really important for us, and we, we continue to try and build upon that. So I guess in closing, um, these are just a few lessons, and it's hard to give real depth to them in 25 minutes. Um, another effort that both Cass and I are working on is taking this work and scaling it even further. We have just um, formed a new uh, network. It's kind of a network of networks, if you will, the California Landscape Stewardship Network. We have six collaboratives that are working in partnership around peer exchange and advancing solutions to common challenges. So this is something for those of you here in California that we're hoping to be able to reach out and spend more time. And then also I think on a national park service scale. So this is really an opportunity to meet a number of the secretary's you know, goals of advancing landscape scale stewardship when we're looking cross jurisdictional, we're working with multiple partners. This is a way for us in my view to do the work that we do at a more efficient level 
and to be able to engage a broader audience in supporting long-term stewardship. So I'll end with that. Um, my email is on the, uh, the screen. Um, a website for this initiative is wantan.org. And I'm really just speaking today to you on behalf of the incredible leadership and partners I work with. Um, all I'm uh, sharing is really the, their hard work. And the Park Service has been an integral partner in this to advancing the goals of this collaborative. I think with that, Cass, um, I'll put it back to you. Great, thank you so much, Sharon, for that excellent presentation. Um, I'm going to be unmuting the phones now for our Q&A session. Um, so if you um, don't wanna be unmuted, you can mute your phone on your end. Um, there is a question in our question box though, Sharon. Someone's asking how they can order the magnet. You don't have to order it. I'd be happy to send it to you. All you have to do is just email me your address. I'd be happy to pop one in the mail. Website, the three case studies that came out of that social science research, and I think I sent Cass one this morning, that, that gives you a lot more detail and really speaks to some of the things I've been talking about. But as far as the magnet, absolutely happy to send. So just contact me via email. Great, and I again, I'm I'm working on opening up all the lines. So if anyone has another question that they'd like to ask aloud, feel free, or you can type your question in the chat box as well. Intelligence force to file further documented and severe case of psoriatic arthritis. Oh. Okay. Okay, since all the lines are open, so feel free to speak up if you. While we're waiting, Sharon, um, you know, something that certainly in California has proven to be really successful with these types of um, initiatives is a really strong marketing campaign. I think we see that with what's going on with Los Angeles and P22 with the Mountain Lions, um, you know, just has a lot of momentum. And, and certainly I think you guys have a really strong marketing campaign as well with One Tam. Um, can you just talk a little bit about how much emphasis you've put on that and um, the, just the value added? I know you talked a little bit of it in your presentation, but um, just the value added in, in investing in that. So um, working as a nonprofit support partner, that is, you know, helping find uh, ways to communicate and support our park partners is a huge part of what we do. You know, we recognize that audiences are changing and, and there's so many demands on people's time and finding ways, compelling ways that we can connect our work to a broader populace is really important, especially if we're going to be advancing this type of work and gaining this kind of support for the long term. So we spend a lot of time um, working with various user groups to begin to test ideas on how to represent this work. So, for example, when we did our work um, with the uh, measuring the health of the mountain and we had to come up with our one pager, we actually uh, undertook in the community about 15 focus groups to be able just to ask questions about how do you think about health or if we were to use this nomenclature or visually represent in this way. And so it's, it's really just developing a presence. You know, I think like the Park Service, um, you know, has such a, 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 an amazing you know, relationship to most of the communities that we work within. You know, putting forward an idea of just the Park Service now working in partnership, that was something that was really important that, you know, with sometimes working across boundaries has greater benefit, not just to the community, to the resources overall. So we've just found it's just been an easy tool to be able to talk about something that's rather complex. The other thing that we learned is most folks weren't interested in the partnership. You know, when we came out the gate, we started marketing the fact we were all working in partnership and most of the community said, well, that's great and shouldn't you be doing that anyway? Um, they were really interested in what opportunity does this partnership create? And so we spent a lot more time representing that through our material and you know, through the website, through just the way in which we market it because it was, Seeing that opportunity, seeing what we could do without having, I mean, if we didn't have the partnership, was something that really um, resonated with the, with the public. 
So we create brochures, we, we have uh, we synthesize documents, we use the web, we use social media, um, we, we stay pretty active in keeping the community connected. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? As an easy audience. Okay, hearing none. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us in this webinar. And Sharon, thank you to you and your team for preparing to be um, presenters today. We really appreciate it. The presentation today will be um, uploaded to the Network for Landscape Conservation YouTube channel as well as our Scaling Up Toolkit um, here shortly. So watch for that. And you can feel free to send that along to others who may have missed it um, that you think would benefit from it. And our 2018 Scaling Up webinar series will be rolling out our full schedule here in the next few days. Um, so we'll make sure that everyone um, who is participating in today's webinar has access to that as well. Okay, thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.